Just need to climb those crates over by the fence. Uh, no, this way. Eh, uh, eh, uh, I go. This, yeah, this way. Uh, come on. Aw, oh, buddy. I'm fucking freaking. <gasps> they walked slowly past a row of crates until they came to the coffin. They stopped and nodded to one another, and Junpei put his hand on the lid of the coffin. <gasps> Mommy! Just kidding. He smirked heartily at his own joke. Junpei grumbled and shook his head. Whatever, just open it. Junpei resisted the urge to remind Santa that he would have had it open a long time ago if Santa hadn't interrupted and quickly threw off the lid of the coffin. They peered inside. What the fuck? Contrary to what they expected, the inside of the coffin was quite large. It was mostly empty, but not completely so. Laying on the bottom was a rusty key, and next to the key... A gun? Yeah. Though this, what's going on here? Some kind of fancy engraving? A revolver. It looks pretty old. I wonder if this is a replica. Junpei reached down slowly and cautiously picked up the revolver. In his hand, it felt heavy. He checked the cylinder. There were six bullets. He'd never seen a real gun, or even a real bullet before. He couldn't tell if these were real or not. The barrel was rifled. And nothing seemed to be blocking it. As Ace had said, the gun was a very old one. However, it appeared to have been well maintained. If it was a real gun, Junpei thought it would most likely function perfectly. If it was real. Holding the gun made Junpei feel unpleasant. He carefully placed it back in the coffin. You're not gonna take it? Of course not. All something like this is gonna do is cause more trouble. It's a powerful weapon that gives one person a huge advantage. Something like that would be way too dangerous to have around. We're in enough danger already. Yeah, I suppose you're right. Maybe. Maybe Zero put this gun here, hoping that something like that would happen. In other words, maybe put it here to make us fight each other. In that case, we should most certainly leave it here. I, for one, have no desire to let Zero control me. The others nodded. They had no desire to be under Zero's control either. Okay, we've got that figured out, but you aren't going to leave that key in there, are you? Yeah, yeah, of course I'm not. Junpei picked up the rusty key and slid the top of the coffin back into place. The gun, where they had found it. Weird. Looks like a coffin key. <laughs> Maybe I can use this. Maybe I can. Yes, it sounds like I did it. Yay! Looks like it's open, Jumpy. I see. This key should open the door. Hey, what are you waiting for? Let's go. Yes, it's opening. That was like some DJ door, a door down to here. That's it. Waka waka. I found it, sir. Sweet. Fucking. I was pretty impressed with how we handled that puzzle. The hallway that left the cargo room headed straight toward the stern. Jumpy and the other three proceeded down it silently. Some distance along it, a large room opened up on the left hand side. It looked familiar. An iron grate covered each of the elevators. Jumpy and his companions drew to a stop and begun to discuss what their next move should be. We've seen this elevator before. We got off one just... We got off... What? Wait, my brain... It's tired. It's, it's late. Hold up. We got off the one on the left just a little while ago. And then we went through to number six door. And that took us to the engine room. Yeah. And after that, we passed through the cargo room. And now we're back here. In other words, we made a loop. We're back where we started. Junpei approached the elevator. Gently, he pushed a triangular button on the wall next to it. A moment passed. The 
the elevator door opened. And shut. Pushing the button had apparently restored power to the elevator. The elevator was now functional. What do we do? Should we return to see that? Nah, this hallway keeps going. If we do end up back there, I think we should see what's down there first. I agree. Let's go. Their decision made, Junpei and his companions left the elevator behind and continued down the hallway. Well, shit. Sometime later, Santa, who had been walking several paces in front of the rest, suddenly stopped. Set in the one in front of him was a door. So far as Junpei could see, there was no other way to proceed. It was the door or nothing. Alright, let's open it. Junpei took a deep breath, readied himself, then grabbed the doorknob and pulled the door open. He paused for a moment and stepped through into the room. And there he saw the number that had hung over the heads since they'd woken up. Nine. Like the numbers on every door. This one, too, was a rough shape made of red paint. Its door was set into the back wall of the room. Junpei leapt forward toward it with a sudden burst of hopeful energy. It was a large double door, heavy and full of solemn importance. He grabbed hold of the door handle and shook. Nothing. But he hadn't expected it to open. The red sat on the wall next to the door. It screamed and vacant. Finally, they found it. Junpei felt himself overwhelmed by a torrent, a torrent of emotion. At least, they found the exit, but cold gripped his heart, and he knew all too well why. As he stood frozen, unsure of what to think or feel, Jumpy, look! Behind you! He spun around, and I couldn't believe what he saw. It was a door with the number 9 written across it. What the fuck? Junpei's voice was barely audible, even to himself. He stumbled toward the second door as if somehow compelled. It was a small single door. It sat in the starboard corner of the room. On the same wall as the door they'd entered from, but in the opposite corner. Nine. There was no mistake in it. A red sat on the wall next to the door as well. Junpei shook the handle, the door handle pointlessly, and muttered to himself. Why? Why the hell are there two doors? It was Santa who answered. There were always two doors. Just think about it. Zero never said there was only one door with nine on it. It is hidden, but an exit can be found. Seek a way out. Seek a door that carries a nine. Of course, you just assume, we just assumed there was only one. After all, why would there be more than one? Oh, man. Jeez. Junpei was stunned. Zero's trick had taken him completely by surprise. <coughs> there were two doors. That meant that all nine people who had met at the central staircase could escape and leave no one behind. Now the reason for the bracelet numbers being 1-3-5-79 was clear. Divided in two, the digital route for both teams would be nine. For instance, 1, 2, 7, 8, and 3, 4, 5, 6, 9. The digital route for both teams would be 9. There were many other workable combinations, but they all ended the same way, with a digital route of 9. What did they mean? The answer was quite simple. From the very beginning, the Nottery game was designed to save all 9 people. Zero hadn't been lying. Zero had never said there was only one door. Anyone who found themselves in the game would have assumed that, that was the case. Fights would have broken out. One team would likely betray or deceive the other. Someone might be hurt. Someone might get killed. But eventually, they would reach the room Junpei had found himself in and realize the pointlessness of whatever violence they visited upon each other. There were two doors. We need to. No need to kill each other. For some reason, I read that as we need to kill each other. <laughs> They'd understand and be appalled, overwhelmed with guilt as they'd done as what they'd done. Perhaps, perhaps that was the purpose of the game. 
that was how the Nori game was meant to be played. No, I... No. That just doesn't add up. That's not enough. Unfortunately, they hadn't started to fight one another. At least not yet. But if one misstep was made, if the wrong mistakes happened, the stakes would rise and the noose would tighten. The force of it sent a chill down his spine. So what are we gonna do, Junpei? A voice broke through Junpei's frantic thoughts. Santa's voice. It brought Junpei back to his senses. No use worrying about the future. He needed to figure out what they were going to do next. There were four people in the room. Ace, Santa, Junpei, and June. Their bracelets numbers were 1, 3, 5, and 6. Okay, well, me, Santa, and Ace can do it. Oh, wait, no, we can't. My bad. In other words, the four of them couldn't open a door of the nine. But what if there were only three? Could door nine open be opened with only three of them? It took him no time at all to determine the answer. There was only one combination of three people that would give a digital root a nine. Oh yeah, <laughs> it could. My bad, man. <laughs> what, am I, what am I doing? That would mean... No. We gotta go back. That wasn't a possibility. He was willing to consider. Santa and Ace agreed. Yep. I agree. We cannot leave June behind. Junpei let out a breath. He hadn't realized he'd been holding in. Are you sure? I don't mind staying. June's body betrayed her true feelings. Her eyes were wet with the beginnings of tears and her legs shook. It's okay. There's no way we'd leave you behind. Santa had said what Junpei had known the moment he realized which three people could go through the door. Besides, I'd rather drown at the bottom of the ocean than escape with this sausage fest. Maybe I'll get to... Maybe I'll get to go to Atlanta. <laughs> what? Uh, you sure you don't mean Atlantis? Oh. Shut up. Perhaps it was the sudden reassurance that no one wanted to leave June behind, but Junpei laughed harder than he had in some time. Santa and Ace smiled. Now it's time to die, Junpei. <laughs> you guys. June blinked tears from her eyes and bit her lip. She didn't seem to know what else to say. Very well. Best we head back to Sea Deck, then. We should be able to take the elevator we passed earlier. Perhaps Clover 7 and Lotus will have returned from door 1. Even as they spoke, they knew finding the others wouldn't improve, wouldn't improve the situation. There was no way they could be split into teams that could both go through the doors. Ace knew it. They all knew it. But there was nothing else they could do. They would find the other three and search for another solution. Alright. Let's go. Ace looked at all three of them, then turned and head through the door. Santa and June followed. Junpei started towards the door and stopped. You were too busy with other concerns to notice the room itself. It didn't seem terribly important now, but what exactly was it? <coughs> I'm guessing one of these doors is going to be hiding Alice. Junpei looked around the room for the first time, noticing the things that weren't door that weren't doors with nine on them. Looks very church-like. A red carpet ran between two columns of wooden benches that ran the length of the room. The carpet began at this large set of double doors and ran down the bow toward. Jumpy wasn't sure. Was it an altar, perhaps? There was a small rectangular alcove at the end of the carpet, and inside the alcove was a raised platform. Resting on top of the platform was a coffin. Oh shit. A coffin. A motherfucking coffin. What on earth was a coffin? What on earth was a coffin doing in a place like that? But before Junpei had time to answer that question. Hey Junpei. What the hell are you doing? Let's move. Santa's voice echoed in from the hall outside. Right. Okay. I'll be right there. Junpei turned on his heel and left the quiet, somber room.
What? <gasps> no. Oh my god. That scared the shit out of me. Oh my god, what the fuck? What the fuck? I didn't perceive this. Oh my god, that was so fucking intense. What the hell? I didn't... I don't... They took the elevator up to C deck. Once there, they headed back toward the main hall, in the central staircase. It didn't take them long. Oh man, that sent fucking shivers up my spine, son. <sighs> Jimpy found Seven and Lotus waiting for them. They didn't look happy. We've got a problem. Clover is gone. Oh shit, shit. Jimpy and his three companions looked at one another. He turned back to Seven and Lotus. What do you mean, gone? Santa East and June had their own questions to ask. When? Why? You two went into door one with Clover, didn't you? Seven and Lotus responded as best as they could. Yeah, we went through the door together. Clover barely spoke to us. She just did her own thing the whole time. There were four rooms on the other side of door one. She wouldn't let us into the fourth room. She just said, I'll take care of this one. And shut the door. She must have blocked it with something on the other side. We waited for a while, but Clover didn't come out. We called for her, but she didn't answer. So I kicked down the door, and, went, and we went into the room. But... It was empty. Clover wasn't there. There's a door on the other hall. On the other wall, sorry. And it was open. We figured she opened the door and left by herself. We ran after her, of course, but... Well, obviously we didn't find her. We figured that much out. Clover's gone. Jumpy fall for a moment. When did this happen? We got here just before you. You certainly have excellent timing. So, you haven't searched anywhere other than the nearest staircase? No, we haven't. Finally, Ace spoke. His voice had an edge of resolve and concern. Very well then. We best separate and look for Clover. We haven't much time left. Let's begin. There were quick nods all around and the six remaining players spread out. What the fuck? What the fuck? Jumpy and June ran into the central hospital room and looked around. She's not here. No, she isn't. They searched a little longer but with no luck. They couldn't find Clover. Finally they gave up and left the central hospital. Think she's up to her same tricks? Slowly, they made their way back to the hallway. At last, they reached the stairs and Junpei spoke. Alright, I'm thinking we should probably split up. Little lot split up. I'll head back to the stairs and take the elevator down to E deck. June, you can take the stairs up to B deck. Alright? That sounds good. But, uh. What? Could you stop calling me by that code name when we're alone? Huh? Oh, sure, right. I'll, uh, I'll do that. There's a reason Junpei persisted in calling her June, even when they were alone. Although perhaps not the best reason. He was embarrassed to call her by the nickname he'd used when they were children. Canny. What the fuck? Where's all this coming from? Nine years ago, it came naturally. Nine years ago, that's when the experiments took place on this ship, when it came to testing out them psychic connections between people. Nine years. Nine. 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 Perhaps that's our connection with everyone in this fucking game. The number nine. But now that they were adults, it felt strange. 
regardless of what he might hope for, to call a woman he wasn't dated by such a childish nickname felt odd to him. Of course, to call her Miss Kurashiki would be more awkward, and simply Kurashiki would seem a little brusque. Though so he couldn't put his finger on why, it felt somewhat forward to call her Akane when they, had, when they hadn't seen one another for so long. In short, it was simply easier for him to call her June and leave it at that. Alright, I'm going then. Yeah, be careful. Can he? June, or perhaps more appropriately, can he? Blushed and smiled. You be careful too, Jumpy. Alright, show your tits. Take care now. Junpei looked, af uh, looked after her for a moment as she ran up the stairs, and then turned around and took off the hallway. Tragedy always strikes when one least expects it. But to wait for a man to stand before striking him down seems a lot crueler than dealing the fatal blow when he lies on the ground. A light in a dark place, June's smile had given him hope, both for escape and possibly for something else. It was that hope that raised his spirits just enough that they might soon be fully dashed. He opened the elevator, and there she was. A woman sat slouched against a wall. Lotus. Junpei felt his blood turn to ice. Her body was limp and her skin smooth and pale as always. It was covered in bright red blood. Junpei felt his chest constrict. He couldn't breathe and his legs began to shake. A slow cold drop of sweat trickled down his back. He felt his stomach somersault. Junpei's mind went blank, all his thoughts replaced with endless hissing white. Driven by little more than instinct, he began to walk toward Lotus slowly. Each slow movement of his limp, stiff limbs brought him closer to her corpse. Finally, he stood next to her. Robotically, he bent down and put his hand against her neck. There was no pulse. No rise and fall of breathing. She was slightly warm, but something, somewhere, in Jumpy's shaken mind told him that meant she had been killed recently. Yes, Jumpy thought, his mind slowly returning. She had been killed. Someone had killed her. There was a deep cut on the left side of her chest. Blood still oozed from it, although clearly her heart had stopped beating some time ago. The weapon had been a knife then? Perhaps she'd been stabbed in the heart once? She would have died immediately. He took little comfort from knowing she must have suffered very little. Only then did Junpei notice. Lotus's bracelet was gone. Last of let's discuss how to remove the bracelets. There are only two ways to do so. One, you escape from the ship. Two, your heart rate reaches zero. In other words, once the bracelet is taken outside the confines of the ship or detects that where is bracelet, a uh, heartbeat has fallen to zero, it will shut down automatically. Was that why the killer had ended Lotus's life? So that they might have the number six, eight, uh, number eight bracelet? If that was true, then the killer was whoever wanted the number eight bracelet. Or perhaps more accurately, the person who would gain the most by obtaining bracelet number eight. Who is that? Who would benefit the most from the number eight bracelet? The thought had only just entered Junpei's mind when... Ooh! He heard a noise. A sound like a sharp knife cutting through wet meat. It struck him as strange that the noise came from inside his own body. A moment later, the pain hit him. It wasn't merely pain. There was heat. Extreme heat as well. He felt as though molten iron had been splashed against the side of his body. Finally, his brain made a connection. He had been stabbed. But where? His body was quickly going numb. He couldn't tell where the knife had met his flesh. Given the circumstances, however, he had most likely been stabbed in the back. 
Whoever killed Lotus had now done the same to Junpei as well. His voice was little more than a weak groan. With what little strength he had left, Junpei turned his body, trying to catch a glimpse of his attacker. But as he did, the knife dug itself in deeper, twisting viciously. He collapsed to the floor, a puppet with its strings cut. His arms and legs lay where they fell, oddly twisted and awkwardly positioned. Jumpy's body was entirely numb. He could feel the blood leaking out of him, but nothing would move. Nothing save his eyes. As he lay on the floor, his life ebbing away, Jumpy finally saw his attack. Two tiny images of the killer reflected in his eyes. That recognition came, nothing. He felt no emotions, no anger, no sadness, no regret. The paralysis that had calmed his body had reached his mind. His killer glanced down at his body. Then without a word, climbed into the elevator and was gone. His eyesight began to fade, the world grew blurry, it began to dissolve into an empty white fog. The fog crept into the edges of his mind, and words in inexorably what? Inexorably inward. Soon, he swallowed up the last that remained in Jumpy's mind, and his consciousness left him. There was nothing more. Into utter emptiness he fell. Into zero. Whatever Jumpy had been, was gone. once more? Or was it someone else? And why? They didn't seem to take our bracelet. They just stabbed us and went about their way. Damn. Well, another playthrough, another end. certainly got a hell of a lot more information didn't we this run couple that together with the information we got from the first run we are starting to get some really solid theories going you know a lot of information a lot of um a lot of dots that are starting to not be so randomly scattered but you know there are connections now there are lines joining some of these dots together and it's starting to form a bit of a picture so we learned a lot more this uh this run um but because that results in another bad end, that means we need to first get a safe end before being able to get a true end. So that means that we require at least two more playthroughs to get the true end of this game. So let's hope third time's a charm and uh, we actually get to see the ending <laughs> and not die. <laughs> very cruel, isn't it? It's very cruel how this game kind of just snatches things away from you like that right at the end it's just like a sunny bang I wonder why Lotus was killed and why her eight bracelet was snatched hmm interesting anyway would you like to keep the information you've gained during this playthrough the data will be retained in your save file yes <laughs> Oh, so we've got our axe ending and a knife ending. <laughs> Great. Begin with memories. You will start the beginning of the game with information from previous playthroughs. Would you like to overwrite the save data? Yes, we would. So next time we play this, guys, we're going to be starting yet another run of Triple Nine. A thirst for knowledge. It only gets greater and greater and is never quenched. <laughs>
which I like actually. I like how I'm effortless, effortlessly going through this game multiple times, and I just feel like there's so much more, you know. There's still so much, and I'm still so eager to find out what is bef what is behind that door at night and that banging on that coffin. Let's just say that opened up another theory in my mind. <laughs> Well, I'll go more into that as soon as there's information that either um, confirms or just smashes it into oblivion. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much for watching, guys. It was um, emotional. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it, but sadly, it ended on another bad end, another game over, another what could have been. <clears throat> So, next time we're going to start another playthrough, and this time we're going to have the memories of the axe and the knife run. So, a lot of the situations that we picked in this run only had two choices. Now, we would have already picked those two, so we're going to have to go through some of the same choices we've already done. So that's going to be interesting, to see how we can get a different ending by just choosing things that we've already gone through. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this, and looking forward to more. But until later, that is triple nine, son. Oh, man. Gonna save my 